Since the beginning of time, humans have gazed up at the stars and wondered, could there be life out there? For millions of people today, the answer is yes. We can't. We can't be the only ones. I think we would be very foolish to think that we're alone in the universe. In fact, alien spacecrafts have been seen by people all around the globe. Brazil, Russia, Bolivia, South America. And sightings are becoming more and more frequent. This is happening worldwide at a faster pace. Something is, is visiting us, trying to wake us up. So are we on the verge of a mass contact with extraterrestrials? There was a time coming very quickly upon us where once and for all, everyone will know without doubt that we are not alone. From the notorious old favorites, such as Roswell and Area 51, to new UFO hotspots such as Phoenix, Arizona and Guadalupe, Mexico, we'll traverse the land, exploring history and conspiracies, witnessing first-hand accounts, and learning from leading experts about the past, present, and future of aliens and UFOs. Join us on our search mission to uncover the truth, next on Weird Travels. Are we alone in the universe? There is no greater mystery. For years, extraterrestrials have taken hold of our imaginations and permeated our culture through countless books, television shows, and films. We don't live in a demon-haunted world of the Middle Ages or ghosts and poltergeists of the 19th century. We live in a world of NASA and the space shuttle and space exploration and Star Trek and Star Wars and Close Encounters. For many people, aliens are more than just the stars of Hollywood blockbusters. I do believe in aliens are here. I think they've been here for quite some time. I've never seen him personally, but um, I don't think uh, we're it. In fact, according to a recent CNN poll, one in seven Americans has seen or knows someone who has seen a sign of alien activity. I've had many sightings myself. I've had many experiences. I've seen alien uh, UFOs that when I was in Vietnam, they were flying so fast, so far above what we had. As eyewitness reports pile up, 80% of Americans continue to believe that the government isn't revealing everything it knows about UFO activity. I believe that there's some kind of a uh, mandate to cover up information that would reveal the truth about extraterrestrials. So is anyone out there? The best place to look for answers is at the site of the most infamous alien controversy of all, Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell is an extraordinarily important event because obviously it, it answers all the questions. Are we being visited? Yeah, an alien spacecraft crashed. The Roswell incident is a fascinating story, not of aliens, but of myth-making. These are the known facts. In the first week of July 1947, several Roswell residents saw a strange object blazing through the night sky. The next morning, a local rancher found debris from a crash out in a sheep field. With the Air Force's 509th Bomb Group stationed just a few miles away, the site was soon closed for inspection. The head intelligence officer subsequently issued a press release to the local paper. A headline in the local Roswell newspaper pronounced that the Air Force had recovered a crashed flying saucer near Roswell. The headline went around the world. Hours later, a second press release rescinded the first one, saying a mistake had been made. The recovered wreckage was from a weather balloon, not a flying saucer. To suggest that the base intelligence officer of our most elite military unit at the time, the 509th Bomb Group, could not identify rubber and tinfoil, instead thinking that that was a spaceship, that's an insult to us and to them. Was it a spaceship or a balloon that crashed on that fateful night in 1947? A trip to downtown Roswell reveals a lot about what version of the story appeals most to visitors and locals alike. 
UFO paraphernalia fills shop windows and street corners all over town. 200,000 people a year come to Roswell. And you specifically come to Roswell because Roswell is three hours from anywhere. According to Randy Reeves, owner and manager of the Alien Zone Twisted Pencil, if an item doesn't have a little green man on it, people won't buy it. But I would say the most popular is the life-size alien if they could find them. And, and then, you know, it really surprised me how many folks are into the life-size products. The mother load of all alien lore is just down the street at the International UFO Museum. Here you'll find all the details of the Roswell incident, as well as lots of other information about alien encounters. There's even an extensive research library with thousands of books, photographs and videos, not to mention several life-size extraterrestrials. The most interesting thing I thought at the museum was a three-fingered alien. I think they are so cute. But the nearby Crash Site Cafe has something even the museum can't claim. Of course I believe in aliens. I have an alien that works here. Would you like to meet him? This is uh, Mikey. He's uh, our morning cook. And uh, he's always doing his job, you know. And you can get your alien to go. They love his crush. He's right here. If you talk to him, they would say hi. But the Roswell incident hasn't just become about cute toys and novelty bumper stickers. Nearly 50 years after the mysterious crash, UFO experts continue to devote serious attention to this bizarre event, and many of them are still trying to prove that it was, in fact, an alien spaceship and not a weather balloon that crashed in the field. I've been doing the research for the last 20, 25 years and full-time for the last 10 years. Roswell investigator Dennis Balthaser has interviewed hundreds involved and believes the government's actions suggest a deliberate cover-up. If this was a weather balloon, why were civilians threatened? Why were they told you cannot talk about this and threatened if they did talk about it, they'd be in trouble? Nuclear physicist and premier researcher of the Roswell incident, Stanton Friedman, finds this evidence compelling. When you have people like um, Thomas Jefferson DuBose, the chief of staff to the head of the 8th Air Force, a colonel and a general when I talked to him, retired, when you have him tell you flat out that he took the call from his boss's boss telling him to cover it up and send some of the wreckage up there. He was in Fort Worth, Texas. The boss was in Washington. And don't ever talk about it again. And I got that straight from him. That's not a third-hand story. You have to respect that. Colonel Jesse Marcel, the base intelligence officer, described to Friedman the strange debris found at the crash site. There were no wires. There were no vacuum tubes, no little tags saying made in Oshkosh. You know, airplanes are made out of standard parts. There were some I-beam-like pieces, the shape of an eye, like, except only this big. But they had the weight of balsa wood, I and mean, they had strange pastel purple symbols along the inside of the I-beam. None of this was conventional. The debris was brought back to the hangar here and guarded for a few days prior to being shipped out to Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. But it wasn't just debris that was shipped out of town. Reports from retired military personnel may prove something much more disturbing had been found at the crash site. Coming up, alien bodies emerged from the site of the mysterious crash. They were most often described as little people between three and a half to four feet tall with large heads, slightly slanted eyes, and a frail body. And later, an alien abduction may offer clues to extraterrestrial intentions. I'm sure somebody on board said, oh, why did that idiot <laughs> go underneath the saucer? Since 1947, the Air Force has strongly denied that an alien spaceship crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. Half a century later, a videotape surfaced showing the military autopsy of one of these aliens. But upon closer examination, it appeared the footage was fabricated. I am still convinced that there, it is not real. I don't know who made it. It could have been set up by the government and, and publicized and then debunked which would work into their favor. Uh, at this point, we don't know of any, any autopsies actually being done. 
To dispel the public's mounting suspicion, the Air Force in 1997 released a comprehensive rebuttal to all charges of a cover-up and the presence of alien bodies. So they issued a report stating that the people who reported seeing bodies were mistaken. What they, the Air Force said they saw were mannequins, these mannequins which were over six feet tall. Well, we've done some checking on that story, and the, and the dummies weren't used until 1953, six years after the event happened. Today, Roswell investigators know they need more solid evidence to prove that aliens exist. If we were able to take some physical evidence and have it tested and prove without doubt, scientifically, that it is not from Earth, then I think we would start getting some support and, and, that, would, and, and that would be my holy grail. For most people, the biggest question is why the government would expend so much energy for so long to cover up the existence of aliens. The answer may lie somewhere along Nevada State Highway 375, otherwise known as the Extraterrestrial Highway for the many UFO sightings that have been reported along this lonely stretch of road. About 90 miles north of Las Vegas lies a block of government land known as Area 51. Area 51, one of the most infamous places on planet Earth. Just 15 minutes away from Area 51 is the Little Alien, a kitschy spot where visitors can grab a cold drink and soak up some local information. I've had people from NATO here. We've had CIA. We've had, we've had, you name it, we've had it. It's just an interesting place. People have, um, they have a, a need for knowing what goes on beyond the mountain range. For years, rumors have circulated that within Area 51 is a large Air Force base where top secret military testing and experiments occur. Area 51 probably has Aurora aircraft, the successor of the SR-71. I know it's got a lot of, they're called unmanned aerial vehicles. These are these remote control devices, which can even fire rockets. Area 51 is exempted from federal, state, interstate, and local environmental laws. And when questioned, the government's response is no comment. There's quite a bit that happens just over the mountains here. You see military exercises, you see flares, you see airplanes, helicopters, unmanned vehicles. Um, other than that, you see things you can't explain. It's difficult to locate Area 51 since it's not on any map. The airspace over the area is heavily restricted and high fences surround the perimeter. Trespass here at your own risk. If you're on the ground, the, uh, there are sensors all over the place to pick up motion of things that shouldn't be there. And as one guy called them, the camo dudes, guys in camouflage outfits in their jeeps will come fixing after you. If you're in the air, they will send fighters up after you. The helicopters have some serious armament. When they shoot you, you're going to be dust. But there's one rumor that always generates the most excitement. I thought that they had reverse engineered the spacecraft that supposedly they found crashed in this area. That rumor stems from the experience of Bob Lazar, who claims he worked at an ultra-secret division of Area 51 called S-4. S-4 was built and maintained only for one reason, and that was to house and to test uh, any other recovered alien technology vehicles. Lazar says he was a trained physicist at the Los Alamos nuclear facility and that in 1989 he was approached about a secret government research project and flown to Area 51. Lazar initially thought the spaceship had been developed by the U.S. military. So they said this is an alien craft and we want to be able to duplicate it and we want to know how the thing works. As the senior staff physicist, Lazar was in charge of analyzing the ship's propulsion system. Here was an incredibly complex system. There weren't, there was nothing even as simple as wiring connecting subsystems together. So the, it, it operated more like magic. Every single waste thing that was going on was being utilized by something else. So it just, it was, for all intents and purposes, completely perfect. Over the next few months, Lazar and his team made little progress in understanding how the craft worked. 
we were dealing with something that had could have some just fantastic impact but at the time we didn't even have the slightest chance on how to duplicate the system or really even understand what was going on it wasn't your typical day job Lazar would get called into work erratically sometimes late at night after six months the calls stopped coming Lazar told a few close friends about his experience and then things got scary and they started following me around more than usual and friends that I hung around they even started noticing uh, people following us around and I started getting a little concerned thinking am I all of a sudden gonna get wiped out in some way and this really started looking like a Mission Impossible uh, episode Lazar claims he went public with this story to protect himself but many people like UFO expert Stanton Friedman don't buy any of it calling Lazar a fraud he isn't a nuclear physicist. He doesn't have a degree from anywhere. Didn't go to MIT or Caltech, as he claimed. But he didn't work for Los Alamos. He worked at Los Alamos for a subcontractor. But Lazar insists that the government deleted all of his academic and professional files. They've gone to great lengths to discredit everything that I've said, and successfully so in many respects. Something they always told me, it's one of the easiest things to keep secret because it's so unbelievable. And that really is true. If I heard this story from somebody else, I don't think I'd, I'd buy it. It's pretty far-fetched. Only the government knows for certain if Bob Lazar's story is fact or fiction. But the truth is out there. Coming up, a very close encounter of the third kind. Their features were small except for the eyes, and the eyes were huge. And later, could increased sightings around the world suggest we're due for an official visit? I have a sense that there's still more to come. It's not over. It's not over. Three hours north of Phoenix, the small town of Snowflake lies at the edge of Arizona's White Mountain region. A popular destination for camping, fishing, hiking, and skiing, this high altitude area enjoys plenty of sunshine year round. But you don't want to be stranded on these mountains on a cold, dark night. Just ask Travis Walton. Born and raised in Snowflake, he's still haunted by his intimate encounter with alien beings more than 30 years ago. For years after the incident, it occupied my every thought all the time. It was it's something I just couldn't shake out of my mind. At the time, Travis was 22 and working on a logging crew in the Sitgreaves National Forest, just outside of town. On November 5, 1975, the team of seven men piled into a pickup truck after a long day's work and headed home just after dusk. We're coming down this road, and uh, we saw some glimmers of light coming through the trees off to the side, up ahead. But we were thinking, well, maybe a forest fire or maybe uh, an airplane had crashed and was hanging up there in the trees or something, because it was just something really very strange. As the men got closer to the source of the light, they all fell silent. We looked off to the right side, and we saw this object. This was uh, less than 100 feet away, this glowing metallic object hovering there, outlined against the sky. Just the most incredible thing we'd seen. Somebody yelled out, it's a spaceship. I mean, it was just, just incredible. And I yelled, stop the truck. To the horror of the other men, Walton got out of the vehicle. And they started yelling at me to stop and get back in the truck. But at that point, you know, the way I was back then, you young guys, I was kind of showing off for the crew. He walked slowly towards the mysterious craft until he was almost underneath it. I was just standing there looking up at this thing, and I could feel this vibration coming from it, the, the sound. The, it's just a strange mixture of high-frequency tones and this, this, this low, low rumble that you could feel more than, than hear, actually. It was like reflecting light at the same time it was giving off light suddenly it rose up a little bit in the in the sound kind of got louder and it started making this sort of rocky motion and uh those guys just get out of here let's go let's go so i just decided i was going to make a dash for it and i raised up and turned to go and wham i just felt this shock hit me and uh it just it's kind of like an electrical shock. It's just this numbing sort of thing, and I was just unconscious. But the guy said that this a, a blast of energy come out of the bottom of this thing, and it just lit up the whole area, just, just almost blinding. And they said it just picked me up and threw me back through the air. 
And they, they said my body went so far and landed so limp, they just thought it killed me. In a frenzy of fear, the crew took off, leaving Travis behind. A lot of people criticize these guys, you know, how come they didn't stop and save their friend? But, you know, I, I you know, we had no guns and, you know, what are these guys going to do? You know, all they could do is maybe, you know, become victims themselves. So, you know, I really don't find fault with the fact that they, they took off. They just did what I probably would have done, you know. Though they knew they'd sound crazy, the loggers called the town sheriff and explained what had happened. The sheriff uh, interviewed the men. And he was very struck by the fact that the men were so shook up, you know, their faces were white, they were shaken, uh, you know, um, one of the guys was still crying, and so they were convinced that something very serious had happened. Three of the loggers came back to the forest with the sheriff and other law enforcement officers later that same night, but no trace of Walton could be found. The next day, his disappearance launched a worldwide story and a massive hunt. There was over 50 men combing this area, four-wheel drives, uh, men on horseback. Uh, there were airplanes and helicopters crisscrossing the area. They even brought in tracking dogs. But after four days of fruitless searching, it became clear that no one knew where on earth or elsewhere Travis Walton was. Neither did Walton. When I came to, I was lying on my back on a hard surface, and I could see a light above me. I was thinking I was in a hospital. But Walton soon realized these doctors weren't human. When I finally got where my eyes could focus, I saw this creature standing over me. They were small, just a little over four feet tall. They had a mouth and, and a human arrangement of features, uh, and their features were small, small except for the eyes, and the eyes were huge. Another group of aliens then held Walton down and placed a mask over his face. That was the last thing I remember. I woke up lying face down on the cold pavement here in the dark, and uh, I could uh, see a light coming from above. I looked up to see this craft hovering there. You know, it was just there for a second when I looked, and it was shot straight up, and it was gone from sight almost instantly. Walton found himself near the town of Heber, 30 miles from where he had been abducted. He stumbled into the deserted town and called his family from a payphone. When they arrived, Walton learned just how long he had been gone. I thought that this was the same night. They said, hey, feel your face. And I, I reached up and I had this, you know, five day gro growth of beard. And I looked at the date on my watch, which was days beyond what it was supposed to be. And, and you know, that was just quite a shock to me. An international media circus soon descended on Snowflake, and it didn't take long before Walton's credibility was put on the line. Then came all these, you know, attacks, you know, claiming that I was hallucinating on drugs, that I'd, that I'd had a transitory psychosis, all that sort of thing. It just, just made it really doubly hard to uh, endure. The Fuhrer eventually died down, and life went back to normal for the residents of Snowflake. But not for Travis Walton. Constantly assailed by disbelievers and embraced by fans, he has found it almost impossible to move on with his life. A lot of people think, oh, you were chosen. But I don't like that. And uh, I prefer to think that, you know, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I did the wrong thing, getting too close. For the time being, Walton still doesn't have the answer to the most important question of all. I don't know where they came from, and I don't know who, who they were. And all I know is what I experienced. So, you know, to me, they're, they're still a mystery. Coming up, accounts from Mexico describe a new and even more terrifying vision in the sky, flying humanoids. Some people think that these are bad aliens that are flying, trying to abduct people. And later, thousands witness an unidentified flying object in the Arizona sky. There were people that were shopping, going in and out of the malls, and they saw it. Um, there were people who were outside jogging, and they saw it. Mexico's balmy breezes, vibrant culture, and delicious cuisine have made it one of the world's most popular vacation destinations. Whether touring the ancient Mayan ruins of the Yucatan or enjoying mariachi music in Mexico City, millions of people love to visit this beautiful country steeped in color and mysticism. Mexico is known as the land of 
wonders and mysteries, the land where the legend and reality become one. But over the past decade, it seems international travelers aren't the only ones flocking to Mexico. Mexico has received more UFO sightings than any other country on this planet. The first in a growing wave of sightings occurred on July 11, 1991, during a solar eclipse. People gathered in Mexico City, one of the most populous cities in the world, to watch this rare event in the sky. What they saw was even more startling. At that moment, when the eclipse began, the people were taping and suddenly a strange and unknown object appeared. They witnessed metallic objects unidentified flying objects appear in the sky just as the eclipse was taking place and remained in the sky as the eclipse was finishing. 17 different people in Mexico City from different vantage points filmed this event. The images that got caught on tape were so uh, spectacular, were so real, were so nitid, so explicit that we finally realized that we have uh, a very solid and important evidence with many witnesses from different places. From that day, the Mexican people realized that it was real. Since 1991, hundreds of UFO sightings have taken place across Mexico, many during the day. The military has gone from complete denial of these events to a more open position. The Mexican government, the authorities, the military, have uh, been uh, kind enough to talk about the phenomena, to give comments, to acknowledge that most of the incidents really took place, that they believe in the phenomena, they don't have still any explanation, then that's the truth. Since the UFOs never seemed to take any aggressive action, most Mexicans were delighted by their regular appearances. But that all changed on January 16, 2004, when a trembling young police officer told reporters he had been attacked by a flying creature in the city of Guadalupe. Realidad o fantasía, le tendremos la historia de un policía de Guadalupe que narra la supuesta aparición de una bruja. As he was patrolling the crime-ridden area in his car, the young officer claimed a figure dropped from a tree onto the road. At that moment, he stopped the car, the patrol car, and uh, he noticed something. This body was floating above the ground. He turned on his high beams for a better view. The creature then suddenly flew at the car, smashing repeatedly into the windshield. So he put the car in reverse, the patrol car in reverse, trying to run away. He has uh, by radio for backup. And this flying thing uh, was trying to grab her through the windshield. She, uh, she was uh, looking at him. It was very close. Terrified, the police officer raced backwards, hitting a wall and losing consciousness. Later, medical tests revealed that the officer had no drugs or alcohol in his system, but was in a deep state of shock. Psychological tests uh, reveal that uh, he was not suffering and has never suffering any kind of uh, hallucination or any kind of uh, psychological disorders. Many ufologists say that what attacked the officer is a new and frightening alien being called a flying humanoid. One amateur video even caught two flying humanoids in the air together. This was like a huge dark being with some kind of big huge cloak above this big flying being was a winged entity. Suddenly, a smaller being is expelled from the big flying entity and fly away. And then that smaller entity returned and was absorbed by the bigger one. Ay, ay, se le pegó! Se le metió! Como tapa. Some people think that these are bad aliens that are flying, trying to abduct people. However, these are only theories. We don't know exactly what's going on. But the images are there. 
UFO investigator Stanton Friedman doesn't find these images persuasive evidence that the creatures are real. I've looked at a number of reports of flying humanoids. I wasn't terribly impressed. But believers like Ed Sherwood think it won't be long before these creatures and others make themselves known in the United States. The people of America are ready for the fact we are not alone. And I do think that coming up in the very near future, there is going to be an unprecedented UFO event, uh, um, uh, an event that once and for all affirms that we are not alone. Coming up, some residents of Phoenix, Arizona say they've experienced such an event. Is this proof that we're not alone? Thousands and thousands of people saw it. And later, have aliens been here before? The petroglyphs show objects hovering in the sky and little stick figure people pointing up, looking at it. The desert climate of Phoenix, Arizona has made it one of America's fastest growing cities. Visitors seek out its luxurious spas and world-class golf courses, while residents enjoy sun-drenched days and moonlit nights. But on the evening of March 13, 1997, as people across the state gathered outside, hoping to catch a glimpse of the famous hale bopp comet, those clear desert skies revealed something far more spectacular. What emerged from the Arizona night triggered the biggest UFO controversy since Roswell. Immediately overhead was something that did not compute. We had never seen anything like this before. It was enormous. It was absolutely silent. And it was moving fairly slowly. I felt as if I could reach up and touch it. My sense at the time was that something extraordinary was happening on our planet. A formation of extremely bright lights in a V shape flew from one corner of the state of Arizona to the other and turned around and flew back. Three hours. Thousands and thousands of people saw it, were witnesses. It was a, a little league game going on, and they all saw it. The kids saw it, the coach saw it, the parents saw it. Um, there were people that were shopping going in and out of the malls, and they saw it. Um, there were people who were outside jogging, and they saw it. The lights took an extremely low path through restricted airspace. And no one seemed to know what these lights could be, or where they came from. Were extraterrestrial beings involved? Concerned, Francis Emma Barwood brought the matter up at a televised council meeting. But city officials quietly urged Barwood to drop the subject. One of the city, assist, the city assistant city managers came to me and told me, if anybody asks, you know nothing and don't talk about it. Barwood decided to pursue the mystery further, but no matter what branch of government she turned to, Barwood says she came up against a brick wall. As far as the Phoenix Lights are concerned, the government knows nothing. Barwood believes that if the government had investigated the matter, they would have discovered that a handful of witnesses had also filmed the strange light formation. Jeff Willis, a UFO photographer for over 10 years, was in the mountains above Phoenix that night and shot video of the lights at 7.30 p.m., almost three hours before the mass sighting. They were probably, I would say, a good, good, probably about 35 miles away, and from their size, it's really hard to determine, but I would say they were probably as big as three jets put together in length. They were really big, and they were moving very slow. They had to have been something strange, for sure. <laughs> The footage that revealed the most detail was shot later that evening by a physician who until recently remained anonymous. I was a healthy skeptic when I began all this. Even though I saw something myself, I didn't come forward for seven years. I stayed anonymous, uh, looking to try to find a logical explanation for what I witnessed. Dr. Kitai first saw the lights in 1995, two years before the mass sighting, just a few hundred yards from her secluded home in the mountains above Phoenix. When my husband and I had our first close sighting, um, it was as close as that tree right there. Um, it was extraordinary. There were three amber orbs in a triangle formation just hover hovering about 50, 75 feet off the ground uh, for minutes. They were about three to six feet each, very soft amber color, and they didn't glare. And the thought going through my mind was, if I don't get a picture of this, nobody's going to believe it. As 
I was watching these two orbs. It felt that there was an intelligent presence staring back. Was this intelligent presence an alien being? Kitai believes yes. And in January of 1997, two months before the mass sighting, she saw the orbs again. This time they were at a distance and they were far west and I noticed them, they were in a line formation. As I'm ready to shoot the three, suddenly six amber orbs in a row, equidistant from each other, massive span, it was over a mile wide, popped up over the three. It was really unnerving. I have to tell you, I started to shake a bit, but I did take six pictures in a row. And as it turned out, I caught this unexplained phenomena head on, turning into a V-shape as the three orbs underneath were disappearing. When Dr. Kitai realized how many other people had seen the lights that night, she decided it was time to share her footage with Village Labs, a high-tech computer imaging company. Founder Jim Dilatoso and his employees have years of experience in exposing fake UFO videos and photographs. I'm a scientist. I'm an experimenter. We're a lab. I hardly ever had said it before that the pictures that we had tested could be an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Using Kitai's video with two other videos shot at the same time, technicians were able to triangulate the exact position and path of the lights. We got very involved in converging all the images, matching up the times that the television news was on in the background with each of the cameras to create a position of greatest likelihood of where the object was placed. However, Military personnel claimed that the lights were created by high-intensity flares from an Air Force A-10 aircraft. I think that best explains the eyewitness accounts and the actual videotape that we have of them. I mean, we have pretty good videotape. You can see them sort of coming into the screen, one after another after another, almost like there's a helicopter or a plane overhead that you can see dropping them one by one. But many Phoenix residents found the government's explanation difficult to swallow. They said, oh, we forgot. There was this group of planes that came in from Maryland and they flew all the way into Arizona and nobody knew about it. That's like saying that I can build my own F-15 in my garage and roll it out on the street and then start dropping bombs all over the place and then fly it back down and put it in my garage. And uh, they would say, oh, we don't know what that was because we had no, no knowledge. I had seen this up close and personal in 95, and nobody can tell me that it was military. This was extraordinary technology in a private gated area. To determine whether the lights were flares or not, the technicians at Village Labs compared the optical properties of the lights to footage of military flares. Our contention is that there is no scientific data that these could be flares. We came to the conclusion that they were orbs that they were balls, that they were steady, they were consistent. Jim Dilatoso and his team also spoke with hundreds of eyewitnesses about the size and shape of what they saw. It was evolving as a flying machine. It was able to make its wings bigger, smaller. So what, according to Jim Dilatoso, are the Phoenix Lights? It's not flares, not A-10 aircraft in formation not an aurora aircraft not a hologram not a bunch of rich guys in uh, lighter than air airplanes in formation it was an unknown we couldn't get a match to anything it's an unknown an unknown those who've seen them believe to be ufos coming up what did our ancestors know you go back into the the stories from history. There's a guy pointing and there's a, a looks like a, a spaceship of some sort. Find out next. <laughs> Aliens have never been as popular as they are right now. New books, films, and television shows about aliens still excite audiences. But how would we react if we came face to face with the real thing? As more and more UFOs are spotted in the sky, many UFO experts say it's time we ponder that question. It's happening at a faster pace. Something is happening. Something is, you know, in, in my own estimation, because it is so extraordinary, it is happening worldwide. In the years since the Phoenix lights were seen by thousands, similar sightings have been reported around the globe. 
one month before our mass sighting on March 13th, 1997 in Arizona. There was also a mass sighting in St. Petersburg, Russia on February 19th, 1997 of almost the identical phenomena. It's happened in Turkey, it's happened in Russia, they've got pictures in Hungary. It's been seen all around the whole world and nobody seems, nobody in power that can do something or say something, they don't want to even talk about it. It's like it doesn't exist but it's been caught on film all over the place. I have a sense that there's still more to come. It's not over. It's not over. One way to predict what these lights mean for our future is to look for clues from our past. It turns out these orbs have been seen before by other cultures in other times. Many people think aliens have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. References to visitors from the sky can be found throughout art history, from petroglyphs in the Arizona mountains to medieval paintings. In the petroglyphs show objects hovering in the sky and little stick figure people pointing up, looking at it. Like, what is that? And this proves to me that these things have been around for thousands of years in this area before we ever got here. You go back into the, the stories from history, the paintings, where you know, up in the corner, there's a guy pointing and there's a, looks like a, a spaceship of some sort. It's like, where did they ever get that idea unless they really saw it? There's stories throughout history of beings that come from the sky and, and light people and it just goes on and on. For the millions who believe aliens are here, there are almost as many theories why. Some say they could be conducting genetic research or mining for rare earth ores. But many UFO experts seem to agree aliens are here to observe our progress. The aliens could have all kinds of reasons for coming here, but surely one of them is to make sure that we don't take our brand of friendship, hostility, out there. Friedman believes the aliens have been keeping a close eye on the simultaneous development of nuclear weapons, rockets powerful enough to take us to the moon, and advanced communications technology. I make one assumption about every advanced civilization. It's concerned about its own survival and security. Seems reasonable to me. Uh, that being the case, you've got to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, but only close tabs on those primitives who show signs of being able to bother you. In spite of frightening science fiction films, most people feel that aliens are not a threat to the human race. If they wanted to harm us, I would think that they would have already, because they've had plenty of opportunity. I get the feeling that it's more that they're observing us and maybe waiting for a time to see us, you know, and talk to us. I feel that they are beginning to come to visit us more and more frequently now because they understand that the human species as a whole is evolving. I don't know if these crafts are going to land. I don't know if these beings that we are seeing flying around someday will land and will face us. We don't know. So what will it take to convince the skeptics that this mystery is on the verge of being revealed? An alien knocking on their front door saying, hi, I'm an alien, I'm from Mars, where's your president? Or, you know, where's the nearest Starbucks? That's, prob that's about it. That's what it'll take. If I could see one, then I would possibly would believe. You know, we gotta see it to believe it, you know. It's probably gonna take a landing for people to believe that something is out there. If it's gonna happen, I think it's gonna be soon. I think at this point that Earthlings are ready 